I want to talk to you about politics this morning. You know what, you know what politics means? No. It's from the Latin poly, meaning more than one, and tit being a blood-sucking insect. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. It, although it's very true, at least a little bit. <laughs> We're looking at a biblical look at breaking news. We're going to try to take... Everything that we see going on in 2020 and put it in biblical perspective. Oh Anybody know what happened this last week, politically speaking? Major convention? The Democrat National Convention? Anybody know what starts tomorrow night? Republican National Convention. If you are struggling with sleeping, I would encourage you to tune in to either one because there's nothing that is more lethargic than a Zoom meeting with a politician talking to you. But that being said, I didn't watch a whole lot of the Democrat convention. I don't plan to watch a whole lot of the Republican National Convention because I know, at least in part, what both sides are going to tell me. Who will the Republicans tell you is the problem? Democrats. Who will the Democrats tell you is the problem? Republicans, right. So you have basically just saved everyone a whole lot of time. Basically, their position is whatever they believe. I believe the exact opposite of it, and that's kind of the party platforms. If you elect me, you put me in power, I'll fix all the problems. That's what everyone says. Democrat, Republican, the Libertarian would tell you that. Honestly, the Communist Party USA would tell you the same thing. So let's attempt to do the impossible this morning. And let's look at the state of America, not so much through a political lens, but through a biblical one. So we're going to look at politics through a biblical lens. Okay, so take off your political glasses and put on your biblical glasses because we're going to look at the politics of it. And we'll use some of the political terminology. But my purpose this morning is not to to be overtly political so much as to answer a very important question. The problems that our nation faces in 2020 are unique in the American experience. I say in the American experience because other nations have faced similar problems before, but it's very unique to the American experience. The 200 and some odd years that America has been in existence, it's unique to us. The phrases we hear and terms thrown around, especially in election years. How many of you have heard, it's a binary choice? Have you heard that thrown around? Binary, mean, by meaning two, because we have a largely two-party system. They say, well, I don't agree with either of them, so I'm going to pick the lesser of two evils. evils. That's the binary choice argument. You also hear, thrown around fairly regularly, well, we live here in a democracy. True or false? false? False. We don't live in a democracy. At least not a pure democracy. We have very democratic elements. And again, not to get lost in the weeds of political science, a democracy is a government by the people. What's in the parentheses is very, very important, though. It's a majority rule. Okay? The United States is not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic. When you pledge to the flag... You would say, I pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic for which it stands. A republic where a democracy is a majority rule. How many do you have to have on your side to get your way in a democracy? 50% or 51% of the vote will get you whatever you want. Aren't you glad we don't live in a pure democracy in the United States? And we'll, we'll explain that just a little bit more. A republic, on the other hand is a government in which supreme power resides in the, a body of citizens entitled to vote and is exercised by elected officers and representatives responsible to them and governing according to the law. Boy, there's a lot in there that we could unpack. That, that last phrase is really what I'd like to focus on, but we're not going to. According to the law. What law? The United States Constitution. The Constitution? The law of... Well, in, in our founding documents, you hear the law of nature's God, okay? That is talking about this God, okay, in case anyone would take you to task on that. When leaving the Constitutional Convention of 1787, Ben Franklin was asked, Well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? And he is reported to have replied, a republic. 
if you can keep it. Because republics, because of their democratic nature, are suicidal in nature. And I'll explain. A republic has elements of a democracy. We elect our representation by a majority vote. To go to Congress, what percentage of the vote do you have to have? 1% more than whatever the other person has, or however it ends up splitting. But America is not ruled strictly by the popular vote. And you can take that one way or the other. If you're a Republican and you've watched the last few elections, you'd probably say, whew. If you're a Democrat and you look at, those la at the last couple elections, you say, Ugh, because the, the majority vote is gaining a lot of steam right now. And you say, what does this have to do with the Bible? We'll, we'll bring it back in here in just a moment. Winston Churchill, who did not live in a pure democracy, he lived in, under parliamentary law and a monarchy, he said the best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. What's he talking about? You go out and you ask people what their opinion is on the issues, and, and they will give you scary replies. They don't know. We live in a, in a nation of uninformed and yet over-informed people. We have more information at our fingertips than any other generation in the history of planet Earth, and yet we know less than any generation, probably, in the history of planet Earth. Pure democracy, someone said, is two wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for dinner. That kind of puts it into perspective, doesn't it? Because if you're the sheep, you're not wanting what the wolves are wanting. But a pure and simple democracy puts you into a dark place. That being said, again, the democratic process is a large part of our constitutional republic. It's the way in which the voice of the individual is heard. I hope you vote. You should. Okay? You should vote because we have... The, I can't find, there's no biblical verse I can take you to that says thou shalt vote. But there is biblical precedent of the Apostle Paul was a citizen of Rome. He used his citizenship to its fullest extent on some occasions. Sometimes he used his citizenship and you say, well, couldn't he have depended on God? Yes, and God made him, uh, allowed him to be born into that situation and he was able to use his citizenship. Okay, So it is, there is biblical basis for being a good citizen of the country in which you reside. We live in America, the greatest country on the face of God's green earth, and we have the privilege to express our voices through the vote. But the question that I want to answer to you as we kind of bring all of this down, because I'm going somewhere with all of this talk of, of different types of governments, is, is it possible to govern a godless people? No. Is it possible to govern a godless people. A man named Teitler, Alexander Fraser Teitler, said, nations have progressed through this sequence, from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from great courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to apathy, from apathy to dependence, and from dependence back to bondage. It's a lot of words. Someone else kind of simplified it. They said it this way. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. Okay? Let's, let's follow this through. Can you think of, let's think of the generation, 1940. What was the hard time? World War, World War II made strong men, the greatest generation. Yes. They came home and they created good times, did they not? Yes. The 50s and the prosperity that came at the end of the 40s and the 50s. What came after the 50s though? Chaos. 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 Weak men, good men and good times had created weak men. A generation that had to fight for freedom didn't tell their children and grandchildren about it. So what was fought for by one generation was handed over by another. Weak men create hard times. And you have the turmoil and the chaos that came with the 60s and 70s. 
Would you agree with all that we've said so far? Yes. yes. Okay. Biblically speaking, not politically speaking. As a nation, we've turned our collective backs on God. I will lay out for you here what I'm talking about. I'm going to ask you a question because this startled me as I was reading. When did America begin the process of removing God and religious instruction from the public education system? What year? Yes. 19 teens. It's a little bit later than that. Would you? 60s? 62? You guys are familiar with the name Madeline Murray O'Hare? You remember all the noise that was made about that? March 8th. 1948, McCollum versus Board of Education began the process of removing God and religious instruction from the public education system. Now, I would take you to task as to whether or not uh, a public education system is, is constitutional or biblical, but that's not my purpose this morning. It's just that we removed what we have is a godless by and large, we have there are some exceptions all around all around the country. There are some good public schools, and and you know of some. I, I believe we have we have good public schools in our area by and large. That's not to say occasionally do you get a do you get a teacher who you think, Ugh. yeah, occasionally you're going to, but occasionally you'll have teachers who, who would agree with you, and and who would agree with with scripture. But that was when we started pulling out 1948. January 22nd, 1973, saw the passage of Roe versus Wade, the legalization of abortion in America. You know something interesting about Jane Roe? You know what happened to her after she, that case? She got saved. She actually didn't abort her baby. Roe versus Wade is based on a non-abortion case. She didn't kill her child. And uh, she did end up trusting the Lord. In 2015, you all remember what happened then. Homosexual marriage was recognized on a federal level. Prior to that, 2010 was when it started on a state level. It started in Massachusetts. In 1954, under President Eisenhower, the two words under God were added to the Pledge of Allegiance. But August 18th, 2020, this past Tuesday, it was left out of the pledge at the Democratic National Convention. There have been many statements that this is not the case. It is the case. If you'd like, you can get online. You can watch the movie of it happening. It is the case. It's undeniable. These and countless other acts and legislations have chipped away at the moral foundation of the United States. We are, we are a nation politically and spiritually adrift. And it's very obvious as you look at what's going on. On the streets, as you look at the things that are happening, things that weren't political suddenly are political. Things that should be political are not. And it's just, it's a big mess. Combining these facts of our moral decay with the democratic elements of our government, it should not come as no surprise that we find ourselves where we do. H.L. Mencken, who was not a believer, a famous atheist, said... As democracy is perfected, the office of president represents more and more closely the inner soul of the people. That's not just true of the president. That's true of the legislature as well. Amen. We vote into office those who most, most mirror our beliefs. And that's why we are in the state that we are in because of the democratic elements of our government, which are important. I am for the democratic elements of our republic. But it does very definitely throw light on a major problem that is just underneath the surface. And in 2020, is above the surface in many areas. Again, Alexander Frazier Tyler said, A democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse or generous gifts from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that a democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy, which is always followed by a dictatorship. Wow. When you look back on history, 
you'll find this to be the case. Democracies are suicidal. John Adams said as much. He said democracies always commit suicide. Because eventually we discover, well, if I vote for so-and-so, they say they'll give me more money. Why wouldn't I vote for so-and-so? And regardless of their moral standing, we vote them in. America right now is reaping consequences of our own choices. What we're seeing is what we have been working for. Collectively, it's what we as and you say, that's not how I vote. Well, yeah, but you're, you're part of the democratic process, I trust. June, 20, or June 28, 2006, in a departure from his written remarks, President Obama said, whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. Now, a lot of people would stop right there and put a period. He didn't put a period. And to put a period right there makes him say more than he did. So let's be very honest with what he said. He said, whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation, at least not just. We are also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, a Buddhist nation, and a Hindu nation, and a nation of non-believers. Now that rubs me a little bit wrong. I hope it does you too. I, I, I know, and if you would like examples, I can do it at another time. America was founded on Judeo-Christian values. Yes. Full stop. There is no arguing with that because you can look at what they said when they did it. Not to say many of the founding fathers would have been uncomfortable in our midst. They were not all of them, they were not Bible-believing individuals. They were not Christians in the strictest sense. If you are familiar with Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson was not a believer unless he made a change in private before he passed away. How many of you have seen, it's published now, Thomas Jefferson's Bible? Have you seen that? It's around. Thomas Jefferson believed in all of the Bible except anything that was miraculous. So his Bible is a whole lot thinner. He went through and he removed his Bible, and you can look at it. It's on display in a museum. He went through and he removed, he cut out all of the miracles of Jesus. So his New Testament is a whole lot thinner. He cut out the, the spiritual elements, and he looks at the Bible just as a good moral manual. That's not okay. Yeah. But he did... The man who wrote our Declaration of Independence, he did have a biblical base. It was wrong-headed. It was not sufficient unto salvation. You can't get saved by reading the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. The only way that you're going to get saved is by reading the Gospel of Jesus Christ as it's fully revealed in Scripture. But I don't like to hear this. Yes. If I can remember, I can remember well when the Bible was taught in public school. But I believe that you just hit the nail on the head because they, I don't know whether they taught it as uh, a way of life in another book. Yeah. The Bible taught as literature, yeah. not taught as a religious, which it's weird. The, the, the pendulum swings from one extreme to the other. We have gone from the extreme of having, if you read the primer that was used in the colonies, it was all Bible verses. And we've gone from that to the opposite extreme where the Bible is ignored as even a piece of literature. Now you can say whatever you want about the divine authorship of Scripture. It's still the number one bestseller in the world. By a, by a sight, it's the bestseller. So for them to do that is it reveals an ulterior motive. It reveals a deeper agenda. So... What President Obama said runs against my grain, but it is, nonetheless, a statement of fact about our nation as it exists right now. Can, can you honestly disagree with this in point of fact? No, because it's the, it is the case. I don't like it. I wish it was different, but it is true. And so that brings us to, is there hope for America? Yes. Not yes. without God. Not without God. Yeah. I, I see you, you understand where we're going here in Sunday school. Yeah. Psalm 9, verse 17 said, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Obviously, this is not saying that America is actually going to be turned into the literal lake of fire. That's not what it means grammatically or what it means in the passage. 
Is it possible to turn back the tide of wickedness that rises higher year after year? The question that we began with, is it possible to govern a godless people? The answer is no. No, the reason that you cannot govern a godless people is because godless people believe that man is the measure of all things. That's called humanism. They say, I don't believe in God. Well, somebody has to take his place. And if God is not allowed to be God by secular man, then man will rise to be God. Or, if you read history, men will rise to become God themselves. You can't govern a godless people because godless people believe that truth is relative. Relativism. We talked about this a little bit last Sunday morning. The idea that what is right and what is wrong changes according to the circumstances in which you find yourself. Or the culture in which you find yourself. Is murder wrong? Yes. Here in Iowa? Sure. <laughs> yes. Is murder wrong in deepest, darkest jungles of Congo? Where they have not been given scripture. Is murder wrong? Yes. 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 Murder is wrong because God says it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Is murder wrong at a Planned Parenthood facility? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Is murder wrong at a nursing home? Yes. yes. Absolutely. All of this, it's, it's a solid, it's a stated fact in God's word, thou shalt not kill. Meaning thou shalt not murder and, and so when God says that, it's an absolute. But when you're trying to rule a godless people, they take all of the absolutes out. And they say, well, it's okay to murder if they have no quality of life. We hear that a lot, don't we? Well, their quality of life was just so bad. Ugh, we just, we gave them a lethal dosage. That's not okay. According to God's word, it's not okay. The fact that the mother is not financially prepared to care for a child does not legitimize the murder of said child. Okay, So that's using a big black extreme, but there are lots of other smaller extremes. Is it wrong to lie? Yes. yes. What if it helps me? No. It's lie. still wrong. right? It's always wrong to lie. What if it gets me elected? Right. It's, it's a solid. It's not relative to where you are, what you're doing, or who you are. Right and wrong doesn't change over time and location. Many godless people believe that they are the result of blind random chance and billions of years of happy accidents. The evolutionary theory. There was a big bang, and then over time, billions and billions of years, things change. And here we are. That's... How do you call, how do you appeal to a moral code of someone who holds to that position? You can't. When given the opportunity to vote themselves presence, they're always going to do so regardless of the moral side effects. When someone is running for office and they say, I am for euthanasia or the murder of the elderly. I'm for infanticide, the murder of children or babies. But I'll give you a percentage more per month. There are many people who ignore the moral side effects and they only see the percentage more per month. Godless people say they want others to accept their sinful lifestyles. You remember this? We've been through this recently. Once acceptance is given, they then push for recognition and then full endorsement. What we blush at. You remember? I, I remember, I know some of you can look back much further in your experience than I can. You remember back in the 90s when things would be mentioned on sitcoms and on late night television and you would go, oh my goodness. You remember that? Yeah. yeah. We don't blush at that anymore. Now we have pride parades for it. What we blushed at, we began to laugh at. What we laughed at, we accepted. What we accepted, we ended up endorsing, and what we endorse, we will eventually end up subsidizing. We, your tax dollars, my tax dollars, go to support things that go against God's word. Why? Because it's impossible to govern a godless people. 
And so that's why we should all take heart at the fact that the solution to America's problem is not a political one. Amen. It's not. If it was, we, if, if the solution was a political one, then I would do a whole lot more politicizing from the platform. But it's not. Republicans, republics, democracies, monarchies, aristocracies, dictatorships, and oligarchies all have fatal flaws. They all depend upon men for government. What's the best form of government? It's called a theocracy. And a theocracy is a direct rule by God himself. When will we have a theocracy? Those of you who have been on our Sunday evenings. When God comes back. In the, in the millennium, right? When God comes back and Jesus is ruling, we will have a theocracy. And, and we will have no problems with our unelected officials. The solution to America's issues, all of them, abortion, education, infanticide, all of these, all of these, all of the solutions is a spiritual one. So let's look at the spiritual answer. Turn to Second Chronicles with me. Psalm 33, verse 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Meaning the nation who acknowledges God as master and judge. The nation who acknowledges that it's God's will, not the will of the majority that should be followed. Amen. So how do we get those marching in the streets, and those walking in the halls of Congress, and those who've decided to shut it all out and stay home to acknowledge God and his ways. We don't. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It's a promise to national Israel. This is not a promise made to the United States of America. You know how I know that? America wasn't around for another 4,000 some years. So, not made to America. But the precept definitely applies. This reveals God's heart on political matters. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, the second word is the most important word in this verse, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the fact of the matter is the lost world is not going to accept the lordship of Christ. You understand this, no doubt. Yes. The, the lost world doesn't care what God thinks. Try and go to stop one of the riots that's going on by showing them a Bible verse that says they should submit themselves to the higher authority. Will it work? No, they'll say, I don't care about your book. As a matter of fact, in Portland, they were burning this book, if you remember, lighting up the American flag with a pile of Bibles. So that reveals their position as it relates to God's word. But it doesn't reveal our position as it relates to God's word. Amen. The problem in America is not godless people acting in a godless manner. Wouldn't you kind of expect it? You'd kind of expect godless people to act godless. You expect the lost people to act like lost people. The problem is when God's people act like their godless neighbors. You'd say, well, I don't go out and riot. I don't do this. I don't, I'm not for such and such. No, but... This verse lays out God's prescription for how to have his hand upon, even in this case, their land. God is looking for a move towards him that's made by his people. <clears throat> He's looking for his people to humble themselves. James, or I'm sorry, 1 Peter 5, verse 5 says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the Humble. God's looking for his people to humble themselves, to come before him and acknowledge the fact that they have sinned. He's looking for his people to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. Amen. That's what we're supposed to do. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, will make themselves low before me, will pray, according to 1 Thessalonians, without ceasing. 
1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. We mentioned this this past Wednesday night. This has nothing to do with the physical position of your physical hands. Okay? It's fine if that's the way that we if that's the way that you do it, but it's talking about to lift up your hands in innocency before God. To say, Lord, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not coming before you with sin. I'm coming before you and I'm pleading for my nation. I'm pleading for myself. I'm pleading for my family, my church. God's looking for his people. To seek his face. What's it mean to seek his face? It means that the seeking of God's face means a pursuit of purity. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Those who seek his face. God's looking for his people to turn from their wicked ways. Do we have wicked ways? You got any? Here we, here we are in church all dressed up and everything. You got any wicked ways? Yes. Yeah, all of us do. You know why? Because we're all made out of the same stuff. And if the Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh, if Elijah was a man of like passions as we are, if Peter, the man who was used mightily of God in the founding of the, first, of the, of the church itself, he had some issues. All throughout Scripture, we read of men with problems and women with problems. And we are no different. There's no magic. We haven't, we haven't evolved to the stage where we say, well, I don't, I don't have any problems. No, we got lots. And God is looking for his people, not the world. God's not looking for the people at a riot to turn to him. He's looking for us to turn to him. He's looking for the church. He's looking for his people. To make a return to him. America needs to return to her foundation on biblical principles. You agree? Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be awesome if we could rewind and take us back to the 30s in a lot of respects? Now, there's some things I want to hang on to. Uh, the air condition that we have in here is definitely one of them. Okay? <laughs> there are things that are great about where we are now. But you, you think, man, if we could just rewind. We, if we could set back the clock. How can we expect the lost or our nation to take God and his word seriously when we don't take him seriously? What difference has God's word made in you in the past week? Because God's word is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Okay? God's word is powerful. It'll change you if you get into it. And we, would, we wish that the world would come back to God, but really what needs to happen is we need to come back to God. America needs a spiritual awakening, a return to God and to his moral law. I believe that a move of God is possible in America today. It's growing less and less likely, but I do believe it's possible. It won't start in the White House. It won't start with a Republican or a Democrat seeking to rule over a godless people because it's impossible. You take the very best president that in your mind we've ever had and you put him in the White House. It would not solve our problems. Truth be told, it wouldn't even help them much. It wouldn't help these problems at all because it's impossible to rule over a godless people. The move of God that will start in America, that could start in America, is when God's house and God's people decide to return to him. That's when we'll see something happen. When, when you and me start taking this book seriously. I don't expect the godless world to take God's word seriously. But I hold myself and I hold us as believers to a higher standard. Amen. It's impossible to govern a godless people. But revival will start with God's people. Amen. Yes, sir. September 11th is a good example. <clears throat> For what, two weeks, the churches were overcrowded after 9-11? Yeah. And then it just started to yeah. go away again. Doesn't doesn't take any time. Whenever we have national turmoil, churches fill up. 
this it's been it's been odd because with <laughs> we've had a national uh, emergency here with this pandemic and it went the opposite way because we, we shut churches down for, for a period of time especially before we could get answers to the question mm -hmm. so it, it went the opposite direction than September 11th but it's always been the case that after major events we have churches come up why because suddenly they realize we actually we what we're doing doesn't work we need God yes ma'am I, I don't have a TV, so I don't get to participate in that way. Has any religious leader of any kind stood up and told the truth about what's taking place in our country? Is anybody standing up with God's word and, and telling the truth? And is anybody standing up for God at all? I'm standing up. Well, I hope you are standing up. Right. Yes, yep. we are. It depends on which but, channel you watch. What I mean the nation, yeah. for the people of the nation. It, it depends on which channel you watch, honestly, because okay. it, because our nation is as divided as it has ever been. Being very conservative in my numbers, 50% of the nation feels like the direction we're going is good. 50% of the nation feels like the direction we're going is bad. We are as divided as we have ever been. So when you hear someone stand up, and they're going to make 50% of the nation happy, and the other 50% are going to throw stones. And the opposite is also true. For, the, for their people or for our people, when their person stands up, we throw stones. When our person stands up, they throw stones. It's just the way that it goes. Again, making it very, very clear, the answer is not a political one. The answer to America's problems, what we see, when you turn on your news, when you get home today, the problems you see, the answer will not be solved in Washington. It will be solved in the church. It will be solved amongst God's people. When God's people start taking God seriously again, we're going to see a move of God. Or perhaps the Lord will come back, and then we'll see lots of Amen. moves of God. But it's, that's the way that it is. It's not going to be a political, a political solution because we're past a political solution. There was a time in America in, in 1791 when the Constitution was ratified. Most people had an awareness of God. Most people lived a different type of lifestyle. Now, that ship sailed many, many years ago. Truth be told, it probably, it, it had started sailing before anyone in this room was born. Okay? So, it's been sailing for a long time. It's gone. Let's move forward for God. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have of coming before you as your children. Lord, and acknowledging the fact that the situations that we find ourselves in as Americans is a hopeless one from a human perspective. But Lord, we know that with God, all things are possible. And so Lord, we ask you to do a work. Lord, I pray that you do a work with me. I pray you do a work in my family. I pray you do a work in our church pray you do a work in our community, and Lord, that we would see it expand as we take you seriously. Yes. Lord, I pray that you do an amazing thing. Lord, we're on the cusp of great changes as a nation. Lord, most of them bad from our perspective and from yours. Lord, I pray that you would spare us uh, the, the persecution that has come to others. Give us the freedom and Lord, help us to use the freedom that you give us to speak out, to share the gospel, to be a witness, to be the change that we desire to see in those around us. And we'll praise you for what you accomplished through us, understanding that that's truly the only way that anything will be accomplished. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.